You're watching Reason and Theology Live, a show dedicated to charitable discussions, debates, interviews, commentary, and analysis. And now, your host, Michael Lofton. We're back, everybody. Welcome to Reason and Theology. Your host, Michael, on a Monday morning, a patron sent me a video to review by good old Johnny Mac, John MacArthur, Protestant preacher, Reformed guy. I uh, used to listen to him back when I was a Protestant, especially when I was Reformed, although I had more preferences for R.C. Sproul than I did John MacArthur, but they're still kind of cut from the same cloth in many, many respects, uh, though they clearly had some differences on paedo baptism, for example. Um, the video is called Exposing the Heresy of Roman Catholicism, Explaining the Heresy of the Catholic Mass, Part 1. This was evidently in 2006. I'm going to review just a few minutes of uh, material uh, from Johnny Mac on the Mass. I will point out in advance that he seems to focus entirely on Latin Rite um, presentations of the Mass. So you don't expect him to engage any of the Eastern Catholic views. Don't even expect him to know what an Eastern Catholic is, let alone engage any of those perspectives when it comes to the Mass. Um, not that there's something fundamentally flawed with the latin presentation that, that's not the case but there's certainly a difference in the way it's presented and emphasized in the uh, especially in the byzantine churches um that that is gives a different feel i, I would say it gives a different feel to the presentation than um the latin, latin right presentation and again um yeah, like like I'm saying, he's focusing on just one particular stream of of Latin, well, of Christian, um, Catholic Christian thought, especially that is the Latin right. It sounds like he relies a lot on Ludwig Ott, which is is actually helpful. I, I find Ott to be helpful on occasion, um, but again, just remember, Ott has his limitations just as an individual. And then again, he's also presenting things exclusively from a Latin perspective, which is again, not accounting for maybe some of the differences and emphasis in presentation um, that Eastern Catholic churches would offer. Um, so again, keep that in mind. If you start to get frustrated, I don't think he's aware of the Eastern churches. Um, in communion with Rome, since, of course, Latin Rite Catholicism is going to be much more visible. I think that that's all he's going to be familiar with. And it doesn't sound like he's very familiar with it um, from what I'm going to show. Um, I have to also seriously question whether or not he put any kind of real effort into trying to understand the Catholic perspective. Um, and you'll see why here in a moment. That's not just empty rhetoric. You'll see exactly why. He he tries to engage something that he hear, heard from a Catholic and then didn't even try to look it up or understand it or then ask, how does that even make sense in light of what the Catholic Church teaches? Ah, You'll see exactly what I'm talking about here in just a second. Let's go ahead and play um, some clips. I'm going to share my screen enable audio oh let me go ahead and make sure the audio is turned up extra loud for you guys mm. well it's at 600 percent, so <laughs> it's about as loud as i can get it um okay share my screen and let's begin as the sacrifice of the cross by which Christ has been sacrificed is celebrated on the altar, the work of our redemption is carried out. It is a redeeming sacrifice. As All right, now you hear this, right? Um, he's saying that Catholics speak about the Eucharistic sacrifice as a redeeming sacrifice. And he thinks that that takes away from the work of redemption accomplished on the cross. He continues. This is the cross. What utter chaos and confusion is that? 
So where do you look for your salvation? To what sacrifice? Uh, the Eucharistic sacrifice is not a different sacrifice than the sacrifice of the cross. It's a representation of that very same. It's, it's making that sacrifice present. That's, that's all it is. It, it takes that one sacrifice and makes it present. What do we mean by carrying out the work of redemption? Does that mean that the work on the cross wasn't finished? Of course it was finished. It was finished and it was done once and for all, as the book of Hebrews puts it. That's not what we mean about the work of redemption is carried out in the Eucharistic sacrifice, as if you know it wasn't completed on the cross, so we got to add something to it. That's not what's meant by... Um, the work of redemption is is being done here. What we're saying is the application of it, the reception of it. I mean, surely he agrees that the the sacrifice of the cross was done once and for all, right? But it is applied to a person in time, is it not? I mean, are you are you born saved? You know, he he believes in Calvinism, right? So he believes that. There's a particular group of those individuals that are called before the foundation of the world, the scripture notes, um, to be in Christ and who will remain in Christ, as scripture also talks about. Um, so that particular group, the elect, let's just use that term for the moment. He doesn't believe that the elect are eternally saved. He doesn't believe that they're born saved. He believes that the work of the cross is applied to them in time. That's exactly what we're saying when we say the Eucharistic sacrifice in the Mass carries out the work of redemption. We're not saying that it adds to it or that the Mass, that, that the cross is somehow incomplete or insufficient. We're talking about the application of that grace, the reception of God's grace. That is what we mean by the work of redemption because redemption doesn't just include the work of the cross. It also includes the transformation of the individual, the application of grace to an individual. That's also part of the work of redemption. That was not done on the cross. The application is not done on the cross. If you will, the work of Christ, it, it is, it's potentially finished there on the cross as far as the application, but then it is actually applied in time. Now, the, the actual merit and all that is completed at that time in act if you will but again the application the reception of grace that is something that you receive as an individual and that is part of the work of redemption yeah how, how could you not call that part of the work of redemption what it would it what is it are are you damning a person when they're saved so when a person is saved are, are they being damned no when a person is being saved they're what being saved right so if a person is saved, that's the work of redemption being applied to them individually. They're, so if you if you use this hermeneutic of suspicion and don't bother looking into what Catholics mean, you would come away with this distorted understanding that Johnny Mac has. But if you have goodwill and you're just trying to understand, hey, what is it you Catholics actually mean here? You would know, hey, they're not trying to say that they're adding to the cross or the cross was somehow insufficient. That's not giving them the judgment of charity. And you would say, OK, this isn't a good argument against Catholicism. And you would move beyond that. But unfortunately, that's not what was done here. The one you had today, yesterday, the one you'll have down the road. So, again, he, he's talking about, you know, which mass carries out the work of redemption yesterday, today, tomorrow, you know. The one sacrifice of Christ, once and for all, is the sacrifice that we're looking for. The one that happened 2,000 years ago. That's the one we're looking for. What we're saying, again, is that we can receive that uh, work in time in the Eucharistic sacrifice, which is not a new sacrifice. It's a representation of that one sacrifice. No wonder in Roman Catholicism there is no such thing as assurance of salvation. How would you? That's not true. This is also what I mean by, you know, if, if a person um, has goodwill and is just trying to understand the Catholic perspective, they wouldn't say that we lack a concept of assurance. We've read First John. It's part of our canon before Protestants ever existed. We're aware of what First John says about the assurance of salvation. Again, we 
canonized that scripture and that scripture was written to us before Protestants ever existed. So I, I don't like whenever they try to use first John and, and concepts of assurance of salvation like that against us as if we don't believe them. Um, we believe that the only thing that we're saying is you can't have an infallible certitude, which if a Protestant is honest, I think they would have to admit as well. You, you can't have an infallible certitude of your salvation. You can have a moral certitude, but not an infallible certitude, unless you have some kind of private revelation from God or something. So that that's what we're saying whenever we fight against those who would try to push this, you know, issue of assurance beyond the realm of moral certitude now into infallible certitude. That's the problem. Um, so can you as a Catholic have a moral certitude that you are in Christ and that you are redeemed? Yeah. Yeah, certainly. Of course. Um, though it's, it's actually very easy. Um, do you trust in Christ? Do you believe in Christ? If the answer is yes, great. Okay. Are you aware of any mortal sins on your conscience? If the answer is, I don't know or no, you're good. If the answer is, yeah, I know I have some mortal sin. And, and it's not that you're being scrupulous. You really have that on your soul. Okay, repent of it. Turn away from that. And now you can have that moral certitude. Um, now, of course, you'll you'll also go to the sacrament of confession. Don't don't get me wrong, but before you get there, turn away from that sin and ask God for forgiveness. Um, you go to confession, you hear the words of absolution, you can have a moral certitude. In fact, Catholics can have more certitude than Protestants because we hear the words of absolution, and Christ has promised to forgive us of our sins when those words are said. And this is, again, something, a concept that we see in John 20, where Jesus says to the apostles, whoever sins you forgive, they are forgiven. Whoever sins you do not forgive, they are not forgiven. And that did not just remain with the apostles that continued in their successors. Um, and the authority and the leadership of the Catholic Church. Um, so we have that assurance that our sins are forgiven because we have that promise from Christ. And when we hear the words of absolution, we know God has forgiven us of our sins. So again, we actually have more assurance than they do. So it's it's kind of ironic whenever I hear them bring this up, just because I think this is exactly why you Calvinists struggle so much with issues of, of a lack of certainty. Am I one of the elect? This is exactly why, because you don't have sacramental confession. So you're always asking, but am I really in Christ? But am I truly in, in him? But will I truly persevere? And, and, and things like that. I mean, again, if you are not aware of any grave sins on your soul and you're trusting in Christ, you can have that assurance. So I think that this is a straw man. This is not an, an instance of him taking the Catholic position and steel manning it. This is just straw manning. You ever know. And let me just compound that a little bit. I was talking to R.C. Sproul this week back in Louisville, and we were talking about Catholicism. That's the background he came out of. And he said what's really astounding about Catholicism. It's the background? He, was he formerly Catholic? I, I Look, I know a lot about Sproul, but you know what? I've never... When he says it's his background, what was he actually a formerly a Catholic? I don't think he was. Please correct me if I'm wrong. Please correct me if I'm wrong. I'd like, I'd like to know. I don't think he was a, a formerly a Catholic, so I'm not sure what he meant by background there. Is, is this, if the priest doesn't have a pure intention when he offers the mass, it's invalid. Did you hear that? Mm. This is what I mean about, and, it, and it's always really hard to judge a person's intention, so let me avoid doing that. But this is what I mean when I say it's very hard to say that this person is sincere because when you say that use that kind of argument against the catholic church it tells me you have not bothered to look into what we actually teach what we believe it gets worse and i'm going to refute that here in a moment but listen because it, it actually gets worse whoa 
The only way that the thing becomes valid is if the intention of the priest is pure. Trying to find a pure priest is no easy deal. Now, what if he's immoral? What if he's a pedophile? What if he's a homosexual? Is that, does that invalidate everything the guy does? And just exactly what does pure intention mean? You heard it? He doesn't know. He's, he's honestly asking. We're going to listen more to the audio. He doesn't tell you what pure intention means. He doesn't know. When he asks, what does pure intention mean? He's honestly asking. Now, how responsible was this of John MacArthur to use this as an argument against Catholics and not even know what is meant? Pure intention, that, that's already a poor way of putting it. Proper intention is the better way of putting it. And mind you, this is, again, a Latin presentation of the validity of the sacraments. Um, now, I, I, I grant it's a legitimate distinction, but I just want to point that out. What is being said here by Catholics? What are we saying? And how did John MacArthur entirely misunderstand it and then not even bother to see what we meant as evidenced by the fact that he's asking what is pure intention and he doesn't know again proper intention would be a better way of putting it um for a sacrament to be valid you have to have valid matter form and proper intention or valid intention if you will um all right what what is meant here by proper intention i mean we, we know what matter and form generally is when we talk about the sacraments or at least mo most people do whenever we have these discussions but something that gets overlooked is intention, right? Um, the intention just has to be that the individual intends to do what the church does when it does this. That, that's literally it. You intend to do what the church does. You're not acting, right? Um, so, for example, if you have a person who is on a movie set and they have no intention of baptizing a person, um, but they put water on a person and say the words of, you know, uh, the Trinitarian formula. Is that a valid baptism? No, because the intention was not even to do what the church does when it does this. This was literally a scripted part of a play, and I have no intention of doing an actual sacrament. That's what we mean by intention. That's all that's meant. Does it mean that you have to be pure morally? I am so surprised that he actually thought that that may have been a possibility of what's meant. John MacArthur surely has heard of the heresy of Donatism, which us Catholics maintain as heresy. He, he knows that we look, especially in the Latin tradition, strongly to Augustine. And Augustine fought against two major heresies, Pelagianism and Donatism. Donatism is the heresy that says the minister has to be pure in order for this to be a valid sacrament. That is a condemned heresy in the Catholic Church. So for him to suggest that the priest has to be pure morally, because he mentioned, well, what if he's a pedophile? What if he's a this? What if he's a that? It's hard to find a pure priest these days. What's he saying? He's saying that what is meant by intention on our part is that he has to be morally pure. He didn't bother trying to even understand what we meant by intention as evidenced by the fact, again, that he asks, what is pure intention? And he doesn't answer because he doesn't know. And what he tries to give as a possibility of what's meant by pure intention is actually something that we consider to be heretical. Now, explain that to me if you have goodwill and you really want to understand Catholics and you're competent. I mean, he's clearly competent. So... Um, if all of those things are there, how did we end up with what we just heard? This is why I have to start questioning what the intentions are. It's very hard to read a person's intentions, and I try to avoid doing that until it's so abundantly clear what the person's intentions are. Um, at the very least, I can say that his intentions weren't necessarily to steal man, the Catholic position. If they were, he would at least try to look up what is meant by intention here and again i don't know where he gets pure intention from i've I, 
I haven't heard of that before. Um, I'm not from, I don't recall that anywhere in Canon law or the council of Trent or something like that. I don't know where he got pure intention from. Um, if y'all have come across that language, please let me know, but it certainly wouldn't be morally pure. Um, cause that would be the heresy of Donatism. Um, so when I heard that, because I, I listened to this very briefly before this um, this uh, video that we're doing right now, when I heard that, I was very concerned because I thought, wow, he didn't bother to look it up. And he actually tried to suggest that what we mean by this is what we actually consider to be heretical. How could you distort the Catholic message that badly? And again, as I always say, if a person is this bad and mishandles the Catholic position in this area, might they do that elsewhere? Hmm. Maybe. If you mishandle us this badly here, might you have done that throughout the whole video and other videos? Maybe. Maybe not. But I sure don't have good reason to believe that it's the maybe not. I have very good reason to believe it's the maybe. <laughs> Let's continue. Listen to Ludwig Ott, my favorite Roman Catholic. Again, um, Latin Rite Catholic coming from a particular stream of thought, a particular emphasis. Um, again, I actually like Ludwig Ott, um, and I, I use him for... Um, multiple things, but you, you still have to recognize his limitations. First of all, the theological notes that he gives you in there, some of them could be contested because those are his opinions um, of what grade of certitude some of those things are. I mean, some of them aren't up for debate, um, but some of the grades of certitude that are kind of the lower level grades of certitude that he uses, those are open for a debate. And it's, 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 again, certainly coming from only one stream of thought, and that is a Latin emphasis. It's not representing any kind of the Eastern churches. Catholic theologian, because I can find everything I need in that one book. I, I would actually say Hot is kind of outdated in some areas. I mean, again, I, I use Hot. Don't, don't get me wrong. I, I like Hot, but you have to recognize it for what it's worth. I mean, there, there's a lot of good in it and use it for that good, but recognize that Ott is a little outdated here and he does have some limitations. Here's Ott. The sacrifice of the mass affects the remission of the temporal punishments for sin, which still remain after the forgiveness of the guilt. Notice we're talking about temporal. We're not even talking about eternal. We're not talking about t eternal guilt. So nobody is in danger of hell in this discussion we're talking about temporal guilt the effects of your sin um in a temporal way not in an eternal consequential way right not in a you're going to hell kind of way um so notice odd is talking about temporal guilt but listen guilt of sins and of the eternal punishment not merely immediately by the conferring of the grace of penance but also immediately because the atonement of jesus christ is offered as a substitute for our works of atonement and for the suffering of the poor souls the measurement of the punishments of sins remitted is proportional okay you're going to get your sins remitted uh, but it's proportional in the case of the living to and we're talking here about not eternal remission but temporal again this is an important distinction. The degree of perfection in their disposition. All right. So what's going on here with Odd is he's talking about how, um, how disposed you are to God will determine how much out of the mass you get that applies to temporal guilt, which, which is certainly true. If, if we're going to, again, if we're going to use kind of this, this Latin way of thinking about things, which I think is, it's legitimate, but again, recognize that that's where it's coming from. Um, and it's not necessarily the emphasis issue would get in the East, uh, but it, that doesn't make it wrong. Um, but I digress. If we're going to kind of go with this way of explaining things, um, he's only talking about the fact that you are, are able to be more or less disposed to the graces that you receive in the Eucharist concerning your temporal remissions of sins. 
the temporal removal, not eternal, not eternal. You shouldn't even be receiving the Eucharist if you have an eternal problem, right? You should be going to confession. But so we're not talking about eternal guilt hill here. We're talking about temporal graces or graces dealing with temporal guilt. Yeah, how disposed you are does impact that. Um, that's common sense. It's kind of like, should we really even have to explain this? Um, how disposed you are to God does impact how much of God's grace you receive. I mean, it's it's really hard to argue against that. Um, now, obviously, we would have to still establish the fact that you have a difference between eternal guilt and temporal guilt. But once we've established that, it's really hard to argue that somehow your disposition to God doesn't impact how much of his grace you receive. Um, you have an infinite amount of grace being offered to you, which is another thing he's about to misunderstand from Ludwig Ott, because uh, Ludwig Ott is talking about there's a temporal, there's a, a limited amount of graces available. He's not talking about like potentially. Potentially, there's an infinite amount of graces available to you, an infinite amount. Um, that's Catholic theology. But what Ott is talking about is there's a limited amount of graces in the sense that you are limited in your disposition, not in the sense of what's being offered to you. What's being offered is a, an infinite pouring out of grace. But how disposed are you to it? That's a different question. It's kind of like I could have this giant um, bottle of wine pouring out wine, an infinite amount of wine. But if you're a little tiny teacup, <laughs> you're only going to receive a little tiny amount. If you're a huge barrel, you're going to receive a huge amount. The same amount is being offered, but it's how disposed you are that's going to determine how much you receive. That's all that Odd is talking about. And he's going to completely miss the distinction between temporal and eternal. And he's going to think that this is an issue of your salvation is now, you know, at peril. And that you're only getting a limited amount here from the, the mass. So it's not even giving you something unlimited. It's just misunderstanding after misunderstanding after misunderstanding. The only way you could ever have these this, this kind of level of misunderstanding is when you approach things with a hermeneutic of suspicion. Rather than trying to steal man a person and understand them, you're just reading everything in the most suspicious way, in a way that it's like, oh, let me just show how wrong this is. That's the only way you could come to this level of misunderstanding. Any, anybody with goodwill who's just really trying to understand the person won't come to this level of misunderstanding. It's really sad to see this. In the case of the suffering souls, the satisfactory operation of the sacrifice of the Mass is applied by way of intercession, uh, as they are in the state of grace and thus oppose no obstacle. Theologians generally teach that at least part of their punishment for sins is infallibly remitted. So, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And again, we're talking about temporal guilt here, so just remember that. So now you've got not only the intention of the priest, but you've got... Which he misunderstood. Not ...the nature of the person's attitude. Yes, in relation to temporal guilt not in relation to eternal guilt or the eternal removing of sin. On the same page, he says, as a propitiatory and impretory sacrifice, the sacrifice of the Mass possesses a finite external value since the operations of propitiation... Finite external value. Again, this is odd. So it's his presentation. It's very limited. Um, and it's also coming from just one stream of Catholic thought, that is Latin right thought. Um, I would agree that there's an infinite amount of graces being poured out to you in, in the Eucharist. He would agree with that. Um, I, don't, I don't think he would dispute that one. Um, but what he's talking about again here, as far as limited, it, it pertains to how much you're going to receive. And and this just goes over John MacArthur's head. ...and impetration refer to human beings who as creatures can receive a finite act only this explains the practice of the church and yeah and that that's a whole nother thing too um because we're receiving what we're receiving when it comes to grace is the uncreated god 
but in a mode that is appropriate for a finite creature. That's a very hard thing to explain. And this is why you have misunderstandings with the concept of created grace. Uh, with some Eastern churches, they, they have a misunderstanding here. They think that that means that, oh, well, you're saying God's created or something. No, that, that's not what we're saying. Um, what we're saying is that the uncreated God is what you're receiving, but you receive the uncreated God in a way that is appropriate for a the mode of a creature. I mean, um, there there's no way that you could ultimately... Um, cross that barrier between the cre creature and the uh, the creature and the creator um and the issue of essence and energies with palamism doesn't really solve this issue so um that's all that's really meant here but that's kind of partly what ought is touching on here and I, I don't think that MacArthur is aware of really um this discussion to really appreciate it so he's just completely you know, <laughs> just misunderstanding all over the place. Been offering the holy sacrifice of the mass frequently for the same intention. What's all that about? It's all saying this. We can't be too sure about the intention of the priest. We can't be too sure about the intention of the person for whom the mass is being offered. And since we can't really be sure about that, we have human limitations upon the mass. Since is that what we were saying? Wow. Huh. Because I was able to listen to all that and get something very different out of it. So, wow. The priest might not have a pure intention, and the person might not have a pure intention, and it might not be really doing very much good. And so they throw. So that's what we were saying. The priest might not have a really good pure intention because he's kind of morally inappropriate with this or that secret sin. And, you know, your intention might not be fully disposed to God. So, I mean, this whole mass thing might not really be doing any good. Is that really what Catholics are arguing? Is that even what Ott is arguing? Really? So that's what Ludwig Ott was arguing. That's really what he got out of this. It, it, it's just curious. It's like, wow, you, you're able to read all that. If that's what you got out of it. Hmm. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to be nice here, but there, there's, there's a concept called reading comprehension. I'm not so sure that his skills are there in this current presentation. Because what he just read doesn't say any of that. That's what he read into all of it, um, which is, again, what's very curious to hear that it's interesting how that mind works, um, that it can read those words and, and that's what it comes to. I think that the only way you could do that, again, is by not even caring really what Catholics have to say. You don't even bother looking it up and you're already disposed against them. You're already just wanting to refute them. So you'll read something like odd and just read all of those biases into it. And that's what you just came up with. For those of us who are watching right now who are Catholics, I imagine all of y'all are just embarrassed right now that somebody would read that and come to these conclusions throw in this little possibility at the bottom that there has to be somewhere a finite benefit in fact uh, part of their punishment must infallibly be remitted you, you got to throw that in why because you have to pay for the mass and and that's why he threw it in there you, you see he he's all <laughs> Let's. I'll address here in a second the, the the issue of paying for a mass, which is what he just brought up. But just notice what he did. He doesn't understand why Ludwig Ott mentions that there is at least a limited amount that is infallibly remitted temporal guilt in in you know one's uh, reception of the graces at mass. He doesn't know why that's in there. So he assumes it has to be in there just to try to somehow explain the fact that, well, I mean, these people are paying for these masses, so they got to get something out of it. That was Ludwig Ott's intentions. That was really what he meant. He, he was just trying to explain away the fact that masses are being purchased and you got to give people something. Why read a person? In such an uncharitable way. 
it, the audio is about to get way worse because he's gonna uh, MacArthur's gonna exactly tell us that's exactly what he's <laughs> that odd is doing is odd is just saying this because people are paying for these masses so i'm not making this up you're you're about to hear that from MacArthur. why misread a person that bad why why import such an evil interpretation into someone if you have goodwill this is why I, I i at the very least question the good intentions here i i i don't infallibly know his heart but i do know his actions and i do know what he's doing I, I see what he's doing, and I have to ask, how is that in accord with somebody who has the intentions of properly representing their opponent? Um, let's listen a little further, then I'll deal with the issue of buying masses, as he says here. That's right, you pay. That's how the coffers of the Catholic Church are filled. You pay for a mass. There are inexpensive masses, and there are mm. really expensive ones offered by a bishop or a cardinal. There, there is the votive mass, which is like the routine stuff of life. And there is a requiem, which is a mass for the dead. That costs you more. There's a nuptial mass for a wedding. That'll cost you more. And then there is a super mass offered by a hierarchical figure in the church, which will cost you a lot more. The Catholic Church admits that you could have mass upon mass upon mass upon mass. You could pay plenty of money. And if the intention of the priest's intention of the priest isn't right and the intention of the person receiving the mass isn't right, it's not going to have much effect. But they That's what we admitted? We admitted that? That's interesting because I remember, I seem to recall when we were just listening to the audio, we didn't admit any of that, but that's exactly what MacArthur read into us and guessed because he didn't actually know what we meant by his own admission. He didn't know. He guessed. So he now has turned in his reading into us very poorly as now we've admitted this. Hmm. I hope y'all are seeing what's being done here. I hope y'all are seeing uh, that this is not being fair to the Catholic position. Hurry to quickly add, quote, part of their punishment is infallibly remitted. Why? Because that's really a bummer to try to get people to pay money for something that might have no value. So you st stick in a little finite value at the bottom, and that makes them come back again and again and again and again to pile up those little finite values. You heard it? So this isn't something I just made up. John MacArthur was actually saying, well, the reason why Ludwig God adds this stuff at the end about how, yeah, you do get a, a, a finite amount of uh, grace infallibly regardless of your uh how how proper disposed you are i mean as long as you're just somewhat open to god you're gonna get some limited value out of it the reason why he put that in there is because we're selling masses and if you don't get something out of this i mean what are we selling it for you see how he just mis misrepresented odd read into him uh in the worst possible way well, I'm only playing that part. That that was literally the only part that I listened to from the video. Um, there might be other parts I'll listen to later and review those as well. But I only listened to that part. And I thought, man, if if he misrepresents us this badly on just this part, I imagine this whole video is, is just like this. Um, issue, the issue here of, of selling masses, by the way. Um, again, this is more of a, a Latin right thing um i haven't heard of this with any of the eastern churches but if if they're there please let me know i just i haven't heard of it this is more of a uh latin rite thing and and nobody in the latin rite is selling masses that's that's not at all what's going on um first of all you you can attend any mass and then also um the masses that you that are always offered on you know feast days or even daily mass or um, Sunday or something like that. Um, all of those, you can offer your prayer intentions there. So whatever prayer needs that you have, prayer intentions, you offer them there. You bring them to the altar, and they're they're being offered up there um, in that liturgy as you are offering them up. Um, 
so that's number one. Money doesn't even come into the question there. What he's talking about is that there are private masses that can be made, and you're not buying the mass. They're what's called mass stipends. You might pay $5 for a priest to say a private mass for a family member or something like that. In addition to all the prayer intentions that you've offered for that person, you could also ask a priest. If you don't even have $5, they'll do it for free. What's the purpose of this stipend? It's more like a donation. The purpose is because of the New Testament notes, the workman is worthy of his wages. Do not muzzle the ox while he treads out, um, while he while he treads the field. And so Paul himself notes that the ministers of God are worthy of wages. You're not paying for a mass. You're paying for their the uh, fact that that individual is worthy of a wage for the work that they're doing. They're a minister in the work of God. They'll do it for free. But we don't just say, oh, well, you're a priest, so you should just be here for free and you shouldn't have a salary from the church or something. No, Paul says, no, no, you you give money to the, the ministers of the Lord because they're worthy of their wages. So you don't just say, oh, well, you're doing work for the kingdom. You do it all for free. Well, they'll they will do it for free, but you got to take care of them somehow. They have to eat. They got bills to pay. And they are worthy of their wages. That's all that's being referred to here is a, is a mass stipend. So again, it's not buying a mass. It's for particular kinds of masses, private masses, which again, they'll do for free if you don't have money. Um, but if you are able to offer them an offering like $5 or something, okay, great. You do that because again, they're worthy of their wages. That's what he's talking about. Mass stipends. And he just took that and distorted it into, we're selling masses. So I guess the fact that he's a preacher, he preaches the gospel on Sunday, right? He draws a salary from his church, right? Is he selling the gospel? I mean, they are paying him a salary to preach, right? Is he selling the gospel? When he writes books communicating the gospel to somebody and he doesn't give them out for free, which on occasion they actually do give them out for free, but obviously he also sells some of them. So whenever he sells them, is that selling the gospel? No, you would say that's unfair. That's that's he's not doing that. And I would say you're, you're right. That is unfair. I don't think that he's selling the gospel. Um. Uh, but if you're going to be consistent, you would have to say the same thing for Catholics with mass stipends. They're not selling the gospel. That's not what's being done. And again, if you can afford yourself that distinction, why can't you give it to others? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you why, because it doesn't sound to me like he has any intention of actually trying to understand the Catholic perspective, which is, again, why I have to seriously question the motives here. If you have, um, you know, if you have good intentions... How do we arrive at such uh, conclusions here? James interviews asked, do you think MacArthur would be willing to be corrected on this? What do you think his responses might be if he heard reply and distinctions, blah, 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 blah. Okay. And um, yeah, it's a good question. So I think that, I think if, and I, I don't know for sure, but just from the stuff that I've seen from MacArthur, I think if you were to present responses back to him, he wouldn't accept them because I think his heart is closed. Again, it's hard to read hearts. It's hard to read intentions, and I try to avoid doing that. I usually give people the benefit of the doubt, the judgment of charity. I speak about that very, very often. Um, there does come a point, however, where it, it's it's possible for you to really start questioning a person's intentions, right? Um, when that person tells you what their intentions are, um, with their words or with their actions. That's when I think you can start to say, hmm, I'm not, I'm not so sure that you have uh, pristine intentions here. I'm not so sure that you're arguing from a place of goodwill. And I think that that's where we're at with this level of argumentation that he's using against the Catholic church. So once we've reached that level, do you really think that he would be open to correction? Probably not. I mean, short of some kind of, you know, gracious miracle, 
God changing is hard. Softening is hard. I, I just, I think that person has their mind made up about the Catholic faith and there's really nothing you could tell them to change their mind. The only way they would change their mind is some serious, huge event happens, you know, that makes them start to question their their biases and their conclusions. That That's really the only thing. Most people don't end up, when they get to that kind of an obstinate place, they don't generally change their perspective unless something major, major happens. So I, I don't have any good reason to believe that he would receive it well. But hey, I, I hope I'm wrong about that one. Um... Let's see. Mm -hmm. um, you donate a stipend. You donate by getting a mass card. You donate, donate stuff. But priests aren't slaves, and it's nice to do stuff and to give them something of what's being blessed. Right. N not only that, but Paul in the New Testament just tells you that, hey, this this way of thinking is wrong. You know, it's it, it's not that they're selling the gospel. It's that the workman is worthy of his wages. And you're not to muzzle the ox as he treads the corn, I think is what the scripture is um, from the Old Testament that he's uh, applying there to the minister. So Paul completely disagrees with the mentality that MacArthur is having to assume whenever he criticizes mass stipends here. Uh, he says that's how our coffers are filled. <laughs> I'm, I'm quite certain... <laughs> <laughs> let's see do, do we have any priests watching the show uh if, if there's any priests watching the show please tell me in the chat um if if your bank accounts are just you know balling right now from all those mass stipends <laughs> you can you can maybe buy something from the the value menu at mcdonald's once a week from those i'd imagine <laughs> But yeah, if, if there's any priests watching, please please let me know. Let, let me know how how balling you are from all, all those mass stipends. Um, I'm just I'm just curious. Um, <laughs> Lance says Sproul helped me understand the different kinds of merits, unlike the residue you think is Calvinism held them back from the Catholic Church. Um, you know, I it's it's so hard with Sproul. Um, I, I have such a respect for Sproul. Um, but then I listen to his anytime he talks about the Catholic Church is just so horrible. <laughs> it's just so so biased and un, and unfair. Um oh man, I, I I don't know what his deal was. I, I think that he just had so much of that anti Catholicism ingrained into him. Um that he just, you know, it 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 infected a lot of his perspectives. I'm not so sure that it was necessarily because of Calvinism. I, I don't think that that's it. I just think that he had a whole lot of uh, anti-Catholic ways of reading things. He also um, maintained some things that were factually false. Like he wants to say James Buchanan wrote the best treatise showing that the patristic era taught the uh, notion of sola fide, which, which is almost laughable if, if it weren't for the fact that it, it came from such a good man. Um, it, it's laughable to think that James Buchanan just wrote the best treatise ever on the history of justification and demonstrating that the patristics maintained the reformed perspective. Uh, there's just, that's an untenable position. Um, th that's certainly not the case. So if, if he saw things like that, that, okay, well, my understanding of the gospel is, 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 is novel here. Um, I think he may have had to have looked further and questioned himself further, but he just, he just took it that no, that this was, this was the gospel was always there, you know, uh, it was never snuffed out. It was always there. And the reformers just brought it back to the forefront. <clears throat> misunderstandings, you know, stuff like that. Um, when was the canon definitively set? Well, I mean, it was solemnly canonized at Trent, uh, but you could argue it was definitively settled at Florence. Um, but, you know, the difference between a solemn definition and a definitive uh, proposal are, are there, I mean, they're distinct. Um, 
there is some overlap. I mean, everything that's solemnly defined is definitive, but not everything that's definitive is solemnly defined. So, um, could it be demonstrated that the canon was definitively proposed non solemnly at the Council of Florence? I think so. I, I do think so. Um, but even if I'm wrong there, you would still have a solemn definition of Trent. Mm -hmm. um, might you have, even prior to Florence, might we speak of the ordinary and universal magisterium having definitively put forward the canon? I think we could argue that even prior to Florence. Uh, Florence would be more the extraordinary magisterium proposing it, but might we although some might even argue that that was ordinary and universal at florence but might we say that the ordinary and universal definitively put this forward prior just in the fact that it's you know it's it's the constant teaching of the bishops i, th I think somebody might be able to put up a good argument for that again even, even if not worst case scenario i mean <clears throat> you got trent so um but i mean we're talking at we're, we're talking the level of definitions, definitive proposals. Um, not, not everything has to be definitive, right? I mean, um, for you to maintain it. Um, just simply something being authoritative, like the local councils in the late 4th, early 5th centuries. Um, that's sufficient, right? Just be, because it's not infallibly put forward, authoritatively put forward is sufficient. Um, but whenever there are controversies, then um, you have to get beyond just an authoritative proposition and you might need a definitive settlement on something if the controversy gets large enough. Okay. Um, and, and, you know, look, this ties a lot into what, I, um, what I'm going over in my course on the Magisterium. It's at MaximusInstitute.com. It's called Understanding the Magisterium. If you want to purchase that course, it's available. It goes over a lot of this stuff, uh, which I need to add a lecture for that probably today at some point. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um. I understand your thoughts on Sproul, but Reformed theology by nature is reactionary against Catholics and then by extension Orthodoxy. Well, of course it is. Well, of course. But why did he buy into Reformed theology would, would be the, you know, the question was why? Um, and why did he maintain it for so long? Uh, anything else? <laughs> stipends at my church are like twenty dollars <laughs> it's about time that they step some of it up <laughs> five dollars was just not you might buy a happy meal with that <laughs> i think we could argue that yeah they're they're worthy of more than five dollars so let, let's give them a little bit more than that uh <laughs> um again if there there are any priests there in the chat uh let me know <clears throat> yeah, and, and inflation too, by the way. That 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 uh that would account for some of those increases. But yeah, I mean it's gonna depend on each each parish, but um if you don't have it, they'll do it for free. And moreover, you could just go to any mass and offer your intentions there during the mass. You you unite yourself to the intentions of the minister and you offer those intentions for that person there. That's always free. Um, let's see. Um, St. Michael, patron saint of increase of priestly stipends. That's funny. Have y'all heard of any stipends being used by Eastern Catholic priests? I haven't heard of that. I, I imagine that there's some kind of maybe Latinizing, uh, parishes that maybe have that element, but I haven't heard of that traditionally for any Eastern Catholic parishes. I, I'd be curious if, if there were. Um, there are liturgical services that are offered for the dead in the East specifically. 
Um, so those again are are uh, free. Um, yeah, I work for a parish, and not every priest receives a stipend, right? Um, let's see. So we can offer an efficacious mass for souls in purgatory without needing to directly ask the priest to celebrate one with that intent explicitly. My friend, anytime you are at liturgy, you are required to take your intentions and offer them and unite them to the priest's intentions and offer them up to God in union with the sacrifice of Christ. And yes, that's efficacious. Um, whenever you're, you're, you know, giving a mass type and that's for the priest to offer intentions for your family member, which they might already do even outside of private masses. Right. But we're just talking about a private mass where that's their intention of the mass, but it's not the priest's intentions only that counts. Why do you think you're there? Do you think you're just there to receive grace? If, if, if that's the understanding of, you know, the mass that we have, and I imagine there are some, and I, I'm not saying this one you have, but there are some Latin Rite Catholics who have that. If that's the understanding that you have is you're just there to receive grace or something, you have a misunderstanding of, of liturgy. You're, you're a participant in the liturgy, and you're offering sacrifice there in the liturgy. You're offering yourself as a sacrifice, and you're offering your intentions before God, and you're uniting them to the Eucharistic sacrifice. And that is efficacious. Uh, <laughs> what else? Let's see. <laughs> um, so Absurd Scandal asks a follow-up question. So paying a priest to offer a mass for souls is more efficacious and gives more grace to souls than if you just did it alone by yourself. I, I wouldn't even put it that way. I, I, I wouldn't put it that way. No, no. Um, I would say that those private masses are more intentional for that individual. And could that translate into more grace being offered? You can look at it that way, but that's partly subjective um, because, again, that that's partly also dependent on the individual's disposition. Let, let's say you are a really holy person and you're intending um, your offering of yourself there for a person that that's going to bring in a lot of grace for a person even even if the intentions of the priest are for specific people your prayer intentions there at that liturgy um might be incredibly incredibly meritorious um it's going to really depend on your disposition but there is somewhat of an an objective difference because whenever the priest is offering this eucharistic sacrifice intentionally for this person um it's 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 focused it's directed it's oriented specifically for that purpose for that individual um and and that's got to count for something right that's got to count for something so I, I don't know if i would put it that way but i i could see how subjectively that could end up being the case subjectively speaking um I, I'm not even so sure that I, I think this is the best way of talking about this. These are, again, Latin right ways of speaking about things. I'm not so sure that it's helpful to an extent, right? Talking about this kind of stuff, being meritorious, more meritorious than something else, kind of using this idea of treasure of merit or a courtroom scenario. And it's, it's helpful because it gets at a certain truth. Um, because those are images that are used in scripture. They, they do get at a certain truth, so they're helpful, but I don't think you want to push this too far and get too legalistic with it. That's when I think we start to have problems. Um, we're looking at a mystery and you can't fully explain it. Can you use some of these analogies to talk about it? Yeah. Can you use an analogy of, 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 of something, you know, being like a treasury of merit or something and, 
using this kind of language this is more efficacious than something else um i think it's legit but it's only one way of looking at a mystery and it's more analogical i'm not so sure that this is really what you would see from syriac christianity or even byzantine christianity you know this is more one stream of thought one particular way of looking at it and it gets at a certain truth but i don't want to divorce that from the syriac tradition or byzantine tradition um or others I, I want to also consider their angle and their perspective on it because they also are getting at a certain truth so just be careful not to get too legalistic with this like um we're going to just start adding this up like it's a bank account or something like that. Just be be careful not to go too far with it. Um, Drew says, love your instruction, Michael. Great reminders. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, uh, let's see. Um, um looking through the chat. Well, I'm seeing questions that are entirely unrelated to this, so I'm gonna skip over those. Has MacArthur ever taken I RCIA? I'm not sure, but I'm not sure that that would have helped them either. So um some some RCIA programs leave a lot to be desired. Um, <laughs> uh, let's see. Mm. Yeah, the eternal sonship stuff, like all the all that with John MacArthur. That's that's unrelated here, which I, I'm pretty sure he repudiated that misunderstanding on his part i mean there was a controversy where he had some christological deficiencies and he backtracked from those from what i recall uh great content as always zach rome says thank you i appreciate it um okay well i think i may have grabbed everything that's um relevant to our video here so we'll, we'll just end it there and you know i i, I probably will review some more of this video um in the near future um so just stay tuned for more um and i appreciate the patron who sent this to me who asked me to review it uh thank you for the material this was good uh like i said you, you can look forward to more i'll probably do at least one more of a certain clip from this not sure which clip yet though but i i'm also grateful to this patron who zip me time stamps uh that makes my job a lot easier if you want me to review a video send me some time stamps so i don't have to sit there and watch the whole thing um unless it's necessary for me to watch the whole thing um all right i appreciate it y'all gc says thank you for the video hey i appreciate you watching uh cactoid jim thank you for the super chat he says just because thanks for doing this hey i appreciate it like i said i, I really do and um you know if if you appreciate what i'm doing here the way, and and you believe Paul the workman is worthy of his wages? Check me out patreon.com forward slash reason and theology if you want to support me because this is my my income. So, um, if you're able to support me, that's helpful. I would appreciate it. Otherwise, you're you're still going to have this content. It's always going to be available here for you. Um, but again, if you are in a position to assist, please do so if you're able. Again, patreon.com forward slash reason and theology or go to the maximusinstitute.com and uh, purchase that course that i'm doing on the magisterium and you'll get plenty of content uh on how catholic teaching authority works and again you're supporting me and my family so it's it's greatly appreciated uh appreciate it mount athos and aquinas he says thanks michael as always good stuff i appreciate it uh giga sniper says lofton is definitely worthy of his wages i appreciate y'all once again thank you all right. Um, I think that's going to do it. We got another evening show later on tonight with Louis Deeson on sacred scripture. So until then, see y'all later. God bless.